Hello and welcome back to Cooking with Grief. As usual, I am Chris and I am joined by, as usual, Chris. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm also very well. Uh, actually, that might be an exaggeration, but you know, I still exist. Yeah, I mean, I was lying for the sake of politeness. I'm dying on the inside, but that's not very uh, podcast friendly. So let's, you know, brush over that. <laughs> yes. Um, again, as usual, we've each brought two surprising topics to this podcast fight. Sorry, if that's probably a bit dramatic. Yeah, it's unnecessarily aggressive. <laughs> I, I don't plan on fighting anyone. But yeah, we've brought two topics each. Hopefully, these will surprise you, interest you, and otherwise blow your socks off. I'm keeping my socks on throughout the duration of the recording. Fair enough. Mine are already off. Your feet not get cold? Uh, no. But thanks for asking. I have a lush carpet under my toes. It's actually not that lush. It's uh, quite threadbare at this stage. Uh, anyway, interior decorating <laughs> aside, <laughs> let's, for the love of Christ, let's get started. Okay, Chris, so for my first topic, I'm going to be talking about the concept of a job for life. So there's a scene in Lord of the Rings, bear with me here, right? in which Gandalf <laughs> becomes a cashier. <laughs> yeah, he got into the wizarding game early. <laughs> you know, his his dad was a wizard, so it's sort of, you know, in the family tradition, his father before him sort of thing. And he thought, you know, I need need a break. I've got real wizarding skills, but how does that apply to a modern marketplace? And it turns out he can buy groceries, but with a flourish. No, so there's a scene in, in Lord of the Rings, uh, I don't know if you remember it, where he's trapped on top of a tower and he, he summons like a moth or something. And like Oh yeah, that bit was always like, really he, weird. He like whispers to it, and then it buggers off like to get the eagle so they can come and pick him up. Yes, which doesn't seem like the most reliable way of delivering a message. Like you say that, yet it worked. It did work. I'm not questioning like the end result. I'm just saying like a moth wouldn't be my go-to, and I've not seen the extended cuts. But maybe there were a series of scenes in which he tried different animals <laughs> first and yeah. watched a crow get shot down by an arrow and he thought right I need something a bit more sneaky than a, a crow I'll go moth well, of course um, the crow was all worked for Sarah man but uh... you're right what a silly point for me to have made <laughs> <laughs> thank you for bringing some logic to this uh, you're lucky I didn't correct you when you, you started talking about Gandalf's father as if he wasn't one of the Maya and therefore essentially immortal right so anyway. yeah but <laughs> But in, in the context of the Tolkien world, his dad was a wizard. He might not have been one of the, uh, you know, like the wizarding council or whatever it yeah. was. He, he wasn't like in the union for the wizards. Was he in the magic circle? <laughs> it, it could have been. All right. Anyway, right. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm so confused right now. Right, no, right. But the, the point of the topic, the bit about the jobs for life is that the moth they used in that scene was born shortly before they started filming and died shortly after the they, they stopped. Wait, are you saying it was a real moth? Yeah. I know animal wrangling for films is a job, but surely wrangling a moth must be so different. Like, <laughs> <laughs> how do you give a moth stage directions? <laughs> yeah, the moth's going, what's my motivation? And, yeah. and your Jack's going, you're a fucking moth, mate. Like, how do you get the moth to fly over to Gandalf? How do you make sure that the moth doesn't just fly immediately off into the nearest light source? He's <laughs> like, for fuck's sake. They they used a CG moth for the bit where it's actually flying, but the bit where he's holding it in his hands. Oh, maybe okay. they, they used a real moth. Anyway, the point is, the totality of that life's moth was... No, uh, that moth's life. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just think then and going, what? Anyway, um, the, that, li- that moth's life was entirely based around that scene which yeah. means that it holds the record for the largest percentage of its life <laughs> performing a single role <laughs> and in essence had one job for life oh what a segue that was a five and a half minute segue <laughs> it was a long walk because i because I, I read that fact and thought it was interesting but i didn't think it stood up enough on its own so i thought mm-hmm. if i introduce it and we have a brief di- discussion about the nature of having a job for life then yeah, i can no. justify you are a um, podcasting pro i mean apart from the fact that we don't make a single penny from this yet yet and that is a big yet like three quarters of the abominable snowman also correct <laughs> Obviously, this moth pretty much does own the record for most highest percentage of its life devoted to a single role. It's either them or the actors in Coronation Street. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I wonder who's number two. Because, like, yeah, like some 
What is he? Like, the guys who play, like... Oh, watch enough soaps. But, like, yeah, they've run for, like, every day for years. Well, because that's the thing, because obviously TV work, you know, even the longest running shows tend to be only be a decade or... So, yeah, so I'm guessing soaps are the... You know, there are characters who have been there for yeah you know, and decades. Yeah. You know, they no, might have, have time on and off, but I'm, 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 I'm guessing something like Coronation Street or... Um, EastEnders. Yeah, it's probably, uh, probably been going since the 60s, and I'm sure it had somebody who was there from like um, like either the start or near the start, right the way through to only a few years ago. For, um, for international listeners who, who might not be aware of Coronation Street, it's it's a it's a daily soap based on a fictional street in Manchester where people shout at each other and drink in a pub. Yes, and then there's also EastEnders, which is the... Uh, <laughs> sort of knock so, version of that version. which is possibly eclipsed in popularity not sure which is essentially the same only they're all cockney and from London but also shout at each other and drink in a pub yeah and that is probably the extent of their differences and that is the quintessential British culture summarised you know what millions of people watch every day as a reflection of their own lives mm-hmm okay so I'm going to take us to one of our favourite places Last week, we spent an inordinate amount of time in ancient Greece, whereas today I'd like to take us to our other favourite hangout, which is China. Uh, I'd like to take you specifically to a city called Chengdu. don't know if you're familiar with that. I certainly wasn't until I read the article. I've, I've been there. Oh, have you been there? Uh, did you go at night time? Well, I was there for days, like several days, so yes. <laughs> so, so you were there during the night in between, presumably. Yeah, I, I didn't go purely for the days and then take a train out to somewhere else, only to return for the following days. Just out of interest then, since you've got some first-hand experience, how dark was it? At night. At, at the time, it was a normal night sky. You know, China being China, obviously there's a fair amount of pollution, so not a whole lot of stars, to be honest. Yeah, fair enough, because uh, they've decided that that's not enough, and they're going to make a artificial moon to illuminate it at night. As you do. I mean, sometimes I look at the moon and say, you know what, you're not enough. It's not enough. But yeah, so... Just, I was just thinking about how insane this plan is to make an artificial moon. It says it's going to be eight times as bright as the moon, and the idea is it will precisely illuminate a range of 10 to 80 kilometers in diameter, so essentially the whole city, and to replace street lights. But it doesn't exactly say how it's going to work. There's some talk about it being a mirror rather than just a shitload of light bulbs, which would make sense to reflect the sun's light. But I was thinking about, basically, if it's going to be so precise to only illuminate a city, it will have to be obscenely high. So, quick physics lesson. Basically, where a satellite is, like how often a satellite rotates around the Earth, is basically determined by how high above the Earth it is. And if you want something to stay in place, like a, you know, keep it over a city, it has to be 36 thousand kilometers away from the earth and in comparison the international space station is about 400 kilometers so if you're going to stick something 36 thousand kilometers away like a mirror that has got to be one fucking big mirror so i it turns out i've i've misunderstood the story i i didn't i thought it wasn't going to be as high as that that it was going to be over the city but you know, attached from the ground. No, it's going to be a satellite. Oh, that seems much harder. <laughs> well, that has been done. Oh, right. In uh, Italy somewhere, there was a um, town where in winter, so it's in the mountains, I think the Alps, there's a village which is in a valley. And in winter, when the sun's low, basically for the sun just doesn't go over the mountains and the village is in dark. Which is a strange place to build the village, but anyway. So what they did is they put a mirror on the other side. When the sun's low in the sky, it still hits this mirror on the other side of the valley, or wherever it is, and directs it straight into the town. And I've just seen as well, in a Norwegian town as well, they put uh, three computer-controlled mirrors to track the movement of the sun, reflect it into the town square. Very important to get the difference between a mirror and a magnifying glass. Yes. Well, you would not want to burn everybody like ants. I mean, the thing with China doing this with the, the supermoon is if there was any country on the face of this planet in this year to pull it off, my money would be on China. Yeah. They're quite good at doing stuff 
As in, like, when they say, we're going to do something. So, Slow like, down, Professor. <laughs> you know, but you know what I mean? Like, like a lot of country, especially, like, I suppose it's one of those uh, drawbacks, but also kind of a benefit of democracies, is that stuff's slow moving because somebody points out the flaws or argues against it. Whereas when you have essentially a dictatorship, you say, we're going to build a fucking giant moon mirror. People are going to go build a fucking giant moon mirror. Like, there's no questions asked. There's just, fuck it, I guess we have to. Or it's like, let's build some islands in the middle of the sea. Okay, yeah, done. F- fine, great. Right. So this supposed moon, not supposed moon, this planned moon, I'm not yes. questioning its moon-like <laughs> status. I, I don't want to see it go the same way that of uh, a Pluto. So if it's that bright and it's centered on the city, is it going to affect have an effect on well, a, a people living there, but then b the sleeping patterns of animals and nocturnal uh, creatures? The People's Daily uh, newspaper has already preempted that question and says that it will be a dusk-like glow, so it should not affect animals' routines. I'm sure bats will be absolutely fine with that. <laughs> I was going to say, surely a dusk-like glow will affect animals' routines because they constantly think it's dusk. From my experience of living in Beijing, you're for about half the year, you live in a sort of dusk-like day glow anyway, so... <laughs> Fair enough. But that's just through the, the smog and pollution. Apparently they did try to do an experiment. Russians tried to do an experiment just to see if uh, you could send a satellite to reflect the sun's light onto the night hemisphere uh, not a permanent test and they actually did manage to do it uh, very briefly then they decided to uh, try and do a better one you know a more permanent one and it exploded on launch and <laughs> that was the end of that <laughs> when you see your life's work go up in a huge fireball you just sort of give up i don't know i've, I've read our reviews <laughs> <laughs> hey we've actually got some very positive reviews and uh if anybody's listening to this, please leave us some more positive reviews. Please. We're desperate. You know, it's important not to come across as needy. It, <laughs> especially <laughs> when we are very needy. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah, don't give us any reviews. Yeah, do what you want. Yeah, we don't, even, we don't even care. He says, caring deeply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so from one giant light in the sky to perhaps another, depending on your religious beliefs. Chris, if I asked you to describe Jesus, what would you say? Bearded dude, wore sandals, walked around a fair bit. I'm no, you know, religious scholar, but that seems broadly fine. And what you've described is way more physical description of JC than we ever get in the Bible. Well, in Luke 2.52... We get, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. So we can assume at some point he's taller than a baby, (laughs) having been a baby for a bit. (laughs) Well, did you say Sherlock Holmes? (laughs) And, you know, later when he's doing all his magic tricks, there's bits where he's going into temples and shit. So he's like, at his biggest, he can crouch and get through a (laughs) temple door. So we know... We can we can deduce that he is somewhere between bigger than a baby and smaller than a temple. <laughs> Anything else? Maybe in the, in the fine print in some of the uh, the spin offs or whatever. But yeah, that's that's basically it. Well, I think one other thing. I hope I don't jump the gun here, but I think we can assume that he's at least fairly nondescript because you know when Judas betrays him, uh, spoilers, <laughs> and he goes and he says to the Romans like, "I kiss Jesus on the cheek." That's the one you want to arrest. The fact they had to kiss him on the cheek Roman <laughs> saying it is the guy who's slightly smaller than a temple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been yeah. like the giveaway. <laughs> just, let's just get that guy. Yeah. But how will we know who he is? He he's the giant who hangs out in the doorway. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'll get a ladder and I'll climb up to his cheek. Also, that suggests that we know that he has cheeks. Oh, that too. It doesn't specify which cheeks. We assume the face. <laughs> Maybe in the Hebrew, it it says more. I'm gonna go kiss, smooch him on the ass. <laughs> yeah, and um, some uh, monk just tactfully changed it to cheeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, going. Like, that's a bit salacious, you know. Yeah, let's, let's let's just calmly. Uh, Erase that. He's just called cheeks and leave it to the imagination. You know, in in the same way that Jesus is often described as riding an ass, we assume donkey. (laughs) It has been tastefully assumed that it's a beast and not, you know, 
the first in a series of Jesus Yo Mama jokes. So anyway, go on down this uh, delicate and <laughs> respectful <laughs> path. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> to return to the highly nuanced and credible uh, research I've done. <laughs> okay. So, so all right, so that's that's all we know about Jesus physically, but mm-hmm. if you google for like a uh, a description of Jesus around the world, mm-hmm. Pretty much every single country has their own vision vision of the guy. Yeah, you know, dressed in the tradition of their own culture, and you know that makes sense. If if God made us in His image, then we do the same. You know, we see our gods re- reflecting in us. You know what I mean? Well, you say it makes sense. I mean, it would make more sense for him to look like a Middle Eastern Jew because he was a Middle Eastern Jew. Like, <laughs> let's be honest, he probably looked. Again, discounting the fact that you may be slightly smaller than a temple or slightly taller than a baby, <laughs> assuming all of the features were, uh, you know, they weren't like, you know, when they describe him as being, uh, you know, the descendant of David and all that stuff, they weren't like, descendant of uh, those white people we've never met from Scandinavia. <laughs> like, and that sort of the thing, so it's like, so, you know, you find, you know, white Jesus is... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, black Jesuses, Korean Jesuses. 21 Jump Street. Also Vietnamese Jesus, who does not in any way look similar. Yeah, but I, I, I thought it was... 22 Jump Street, that I'm not in any way original. Good, you could have lied to me and said it was your own. Ah, but then um, I've been lying to our listeners. And I don't take them for fools. <laughs> but me on the other hand. <laughs> in Googling various images of Jesus around the world, mm-hmm. um, I found some... Uh, some pretty weird ones. Have you seen the Korean ripped Jesus? No. In Yongchun, in in a uh, South Korea, there's a Christian sculpture park, mm-hmm. and he's he's on the uh, crucifix, but he looks more like he's doing butterfly curls because he's absolutely <laughs> ripped. He's like he's got like a twelve pack, massive like you know vascular lats. And he just looks like he's, you know, finishing up his third set. He's absolutely <laughs> huge. And, you know, you can sort of get behind a a, a messiah like that. Yeah, Jesus will lift the burden of your sins. Yeah, and then goblin squat them for, <laughs> for 12 reps. You know, he, he went out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, touching neither bread nor water, but had quite a lot of lean chicken breast <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, whey protein. People have done, you know, statues of Jesus as a as a boxer, a modern-day boxer with gloves that say mercy on him. That's and again, a weird... Weird way of looking at things. Punch you with love. Turns the other cheek with a left hook. <laughs> uh, the weirdest one, like in terms of the ideology behind it, there's a there's a mural of Jesus in Wall Street, like up in the uh, top offices of skyscraper, making like business deals with venture capitalists and shaking hands with essentially the modern equivalent of the money lenders, which I'm say. pretty sh- pretty sure. I mean, I- if you if you, if you, you know, he beat the shit out of them being. Yeah. I know that was part of the reason where they were, them being in the temple and all that. But still, he didn't like respectfully say, "Look, I respect what you're doing. Just please don't do it here." I mean, he probably yeah. flipped his hey, shit. Hey, moneylenders, we're all going to make a living. I understand that, and who cares if it's at the expense of uh, perhaps some of the poorer members in our society? <laughs> I'm going to shake your hand. No, he flipped their tables. Yeah, before. Possibly storming into the temple, or possibly Crouching. not being able to quite get in there <laughs> because of his, you know, <laughs> nine foot frame. Who knows? That's the thing. That's like that phrase. What would Jesus do? Does include flipping tables and whipping people. Okay, so that's the uh, last of my two topics, Chris. What have you got to close us out with? All right. Well, I'd like to talk about a woman who was the first women's Grand Prix winner. She had quite a remarkable life. Unfortunately, it ends horrifically. And since Cooking with Grief is supposed to be like an ironic title, I'm going to get the grief bit out of the way now so that we can end on a high note. Unfortunately, she lived through World War II, which was obviously a shitty time for everybody. And she lived in France, which made it even more shitty. And unfortunately, she was alleged to have been a Gestapo spy, but that was probably almost certainly untrue. In fact, it's like almost certain, like it's widely agreed that that was not true. But because she somehow got through World War II somehow unscathed by Germans, there were rumours swirling around her about her being either a Nazi sympathiser, a collaborator, or 
or maybe even just having an affair with a German soldier that was enough and to tarnish your name. And so her career was over after that and she uh, basically lost all the money she ever had over the next 35 years and died penniless and alone and literally starving to death. Which is very depressing, but... So, see, we're going to rewind, do this whole, like, this, memento this style. better be an optimistic book. Yes. Well, her life before them was actually really, like, quite interesting. So she started off... I should just realise there was also another depressing bit in her life, but we'll skip over that. Um, basically, so she grew up in... Uh, so, sorry, let's say what her name was. She's called... I think it's pronounced... El Nice, but I'm going to call her Helen Ice. <laughs> it's spelled H E L L E space N I C E, and she's French. So, like I say, I assume that's something like El Nice, but Helen Ice. She was born in 1900, just outside, well, a bit outside Paris. Basically, when she was a teenager, she moved to Paris itself and became a nude model. And the Drawings and stuff that she was used for were used to promote, like, uh, dances and stuff like that. You know, Moulin Rouge-style stuff. And then she took, using the money she got from that, she uh, took dancing lessons. And she herself became one of the uh, one of the dancers. She was actually, her real name was Helene Delangel, but she changed it to Helen Ice as her dancing name. Using the money she earned from dancing, uh, she bought a car. And she got into driving and enjoyed it. She was friends with a racing driver. So she tried to go and uh, do some races, but she got rejected for being a woman. But what happened was she went skiing some one time and there was an avalanche. And James Bond style, she decided to escape the avalanche by jumping across a ravine whilst on skis. And uh, while she survived the avalanche, she unfortunately like destroyed her knees. So she couldn't dance anymore, thus ending that career. But... That gave her more time to pursue racing driving. So then there was the first ever Women's Grand Prix and she took part of it, which was for female drivers only. I think this was 1929. And here's the best thing, right? So first ever Women's Grand Prix. The night before, and I quote, she indulged in a long night of champagne, morphine and sex. And then she went on to win the race. Which, as weekends go... I mean, if you can say your weekend involved <laughs> champagne, morphine, sex, and winning a race, <laughs> like, you've had a good weekend. Yeah, that is so much to talk about in the office on Monday morning. You know, somebody says, how was your weekend? It's like, well, you know, I won a, won a Grand Prix, uh, had morphine, <laughs> lots of champagne and sex. It's like, oh, so you won the Grand Prix and then you celebrated with the morphine and the champagne and sex. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, no that was my, the way that was my warm-up. <laughs> well, it, it shows how... how how much times have changed a that she wouldn't be allowed to to race the men but also in 2008 after usain bolt won the 100 meters yeah. they asked him what he did to prepare and he said he ate a lot of chicken nuggets from mcdonald's because yeah. he didn't like the chinese <laughs> food and that that was like a new story mm -hmm. and it's like okay you ate some processed <laughs> chicken had he you know ha had a had a you know weekend of hard drinking and, and drugs that'd be a much more interesting story oh well, exactly i mean you don't get that obviously peak sports perform like lewis hamilton's like a vegan and stuff now to help with his preparation and all that you know it's all very finely tuned like precision athletes like they make sure they weigh like the exact amount they need to, to have enough mass to control the car without unnecessary weight and all that and uh yeah, there's just like morphine sex. Because there's a whole like industry around, you know, athletes now. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously every team's got nutritionists. Yeah, exactly. Whereas like even in the 70s, like footballers be smoking on the side of the pitch mm -hmm. as they're warming up, ready to go on. Even in the 90s, there was a football player who said his warm up was uh, before every game, he had uh, two Snickers and a can of Pepsi or something like that. <laughs> that was his pregame ritual. Well, you know, whatever works, you know, for the time, I guess. I was gonna ask if you knew what the cars were like in nineteen in the nineteen twenties. Like, how what what sort of how fast were they well, compared to modern Formula One? Obviously, yeah. So they were slower, quite a lot but... slower. So she won that race in a uh, Omega Six. After that winning, she became a Bugatti driver because they, you know, she was glamorous and all that. And so they signed her sort of a advertising contract thing, you know, like. You'll race for us. You'll you make us look good. Here's a free car. And in a Bugatti, she set the land speed record for women of just shy of 200 kilometers an hour. 
197.7. So she's going about 120, which is obviously not like the 200 mile an hour stuff now. But still, pretty impressive. Like, especially because, I mean, like, what do you say? This was in 1929. So, what is it? 30 years before that, you'd be lucky to... How fast could a horse go? Like, 40 miles an hour? Like, that was the fastest humans had ever been. <laughs> and so she... Um, so, she, yes, yeah, so she continued to get all these, um, you know, more and more fame as she drove around. And uh, she drove in the US and she uh, drove without wearing a helmet because... The crowds like to see one, my hair when I'm driving, is the quote. Which, again, driving around at 100 miles an hour in cars which have zero safety features and be like, I'm not going to wear a helmet because I know I look good with my hair flowing behind me. Yeah, but I mean, if you're the sort of person that prepares for a big race with a debaucherous weekend, then chances are, I'm guessing you're not particularly risk averse either. Mm -hmm, exactly. You know, back in the day, like Sterling Sharp, or Sir Sterling Sharp, British Formula One, uh, racer from back in the day I remember him saying and it was the standard thinking of the time was don't wear a seat belt because if you crash it's safer to just get thrown out of the wreckage <laughs> which is a remarkable like overestimation about how strong the human body is your your flesh is soft it will it will cushion your landing well it's because they were also terrified of being caught in a fire because the cars used to be I don't know like these particular cars she was driving but they uh experimented at one point they started making cars out of magnesium because it's really light just unfortunately it's incredibly <laughs> flammable like the smallest thing yeah. goes wrong and it just the whole thing goes up yeah so you're telling me my my pitch for uh, cesium cars isn't going to go down well either as the epilogue before the horrific epilogue she won a lot more races well she won the women's race a lot she never actually won a men's race but the fact that she was competing with them and she finished uh, she was basically getting the equivalent of $100,000 in terms of entry fees just for qualifying for these races. And then even though she didn't win any of those races, that's still the fact she was competitive enough to be racing them shows how, like, she was right up there. Yeah, that's all we've got time for this week. So I think on that note, I will bid thee farewell. And I will join him in his bidding of the farewell with a similar goodbye and thank you for listening and hope to uh, have you listen again next time yes exactly ciao uh, goodbye it's nice to say goodbye depending on the person obviously sometimes it's heartbreaking <laughs> sometimes it's you know really traumatic yes in this case it is merely a farewell <laughs> it's blessed relief <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to this episode of cooking with grief if you enjoyed it please make sure to recommend it to a friend if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email cookingwithgrief at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. That's at cookingwithgrief. If you'd like to hear more episodes, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you've got the time, then it'd be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you.